Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Now, when I was asked to come and speak, I was told that um, I might have a, quite a varied group of people here. And it's helpful to me to know who you are so that I can really gauge the things that I say according to what your major interests are. How many of you are students here or at another college nearby? Okay, a lot of you. Um, how many of you are parents of people with learning disabilities? Good. How many of you are other professionals? Note how I said that, such as psychologists, professors, and so forth. Oops, not too many there, but a few. Thank you for coming. Okay, what I'm going to do uh, this evening is really go through three different parts of this speech with some overheads. We have to know the stages uh, in a person with learning disability uh, in, in the, those lives in order to understand the overall commonality of learning disabilities. So we'll go through those stages of life from the beginning of school through young adulthood and we will be identifying some of our problems. Identifying learning disabilities, in other words, what is it? and what we should be doing to help people with learning disabilities. As we go through this, uh, I will also, I'm going to have to stand back from this, it's making too much noise. There. I, I also want to leave plenty of time for questions and answers so that those concerns that you have or are, have questions about will have full time to be addressed. So let's begin at the beginning. In 1978 or 79, Dr. Sylvia Richardson, who was is former president of the National Horn Society and a dear friend of mine, uh, and I did a, a program together. And it was called How to Get Out of the Mainstream Without Muddying the Water. And what that meant was that that was the time when we were beginning to talk about mainstreaming people with learning disabilities, putting them into regular ed classes. That was the idea. We could be having the same speech today. That hasn't changed. Um, things in some ways have gotten worse. With the multi-categorical placements in the public schools, there are many people who try to enter a college program whose parents and themselves do not really know what the disabilities are that, that these young men and women have. In all honesty, if my own children were in public schools right now, I don't know what I'd do. I have considered, I have three new grandsons under the age of two and a half. Somebody's sure to be LD. And I'm wondering about homeschooling. And the tragedy of that is, is that I know we have wonderful teachers. I, some of them are my children, some of them are my students, some of them are people I meet as I go around the country. I know they're there. But the way the public schools have been set up in this day and age with the recessions and the budget cutbacks, uh, schools are very limited in the types of resources that they can have available for students with special needs. In some states, I was in Colorado recently, there are no more pull-out programs where students with learning disabilities go to a resource room, let alone a self-contained, and are taught according to their needs. The LD resource teacher, it serves, quote, as a resource for the regular classroom teacher. Well, anybody who's had a learning disability will tell you that if you're sitting in the back of the room doing your thing, and everybody else in the class is in a different book, everybody knows it. And the social problems that are associated with separating children like that and pretending, because that's all it is, is pretense, to be serving them in a social setting uh, by putting them in with other age mate students is a very questionable service to them. Now, everybody with learning disabilities is going to grow up. You can't stop it. 
the physiological growth is going to occur. The emotional growth may be more difficult. And harder still for parents is the letting go. Parents who are used to doing virtually everything for their, their children, in many cases because of the limitations that they perceive in that child, it's scary for them to let go, even at the college level. I run into this all the time. No telling the trouble he's going to get into. Some of those fears are certainly justified. For the potential student, it can also be frightening. What happened to his base of support? Where is it now in a big college setting? Who does he go to when he doesn't know how to do something? And what do you do about professors who felt that they've been teaching well all of these years and now they have somebody who isn't learning the way their other students learned and they thought they were doing a good job, why now should they change it? For professors who think that giving a, an LD student extra time to finish his exam because he thought it was unfair to other students, those are professors who haven't studied the research and now they do not know that clearly research from across the country shows that a student with learning disabilities will come up in, in great measure on their exams when they are given an untimed testing situation versus the non-LD students whose grades do not change. To ignore those kinds of research data are to put another boulder in the way of a student who learns differently. Now, I find, and this always amazes me, because I've been in this field for 25 years, ever since my son at the age of four was diagnosed as having a learning disability, then I was told to take him home and love him, because there was no other place for him to receive services. No one within a hundred miles was trained to help him. And I thought that was kind of dumb, because I already loved him and I really had intended to take him home. And so I decided that because of a significant lack of volunteers, somebody better go learn what this thing called learning disabilities was all about. And so as a regular ed teacher, I went back to school. And then I finally went on and got a master's and a doctorate because I figured that I had to get enough letters after my name that somebody would pay attention to me. So that's how I've been doing this. But I still find, despite all of the, the track stars and the Olympic stars and the television writers like Stephen J. Cannell and, and Greg Luganis and Bruce Jenner and all of the famous people, uh, both in the tenor entertainment field as well as in the sciences and literature, like Agatha Christie and Winston Churchill who have had learning disabilities, people still honestly believe that LD means lazy and dumb. It blows my mind. It especially blows my mind since for the last 15 years I've run a college program for students with learning disabilities who do very well, thank you. They go on and get the same kind of degrees everybody else gets. Nobody gives them less course requirements or waters down the curriculum or in any way does anything to change the course content with the exception of maybe some of their books are on tape. Maybe some of them need tests with a longer time frame to take it. Maybe some of them need note takers in the class because they can't write fast enough. Big deal. My son calls that his secretary. So that's what I want to try to talk to you about tonight in these three things I want to touch on. So the first one is, who are these people? First of all, they compromise about 10% of the population of the United States. That's a lot of people. 5% of those people will go on through their careers and probably not even get identified in this day and age until they hit some college courses with some knowledgeable professors. They're simply so mild that it's been a struggle but they've managed to hang on and get through. There's another group who, because there were no LD specialists when they were going to school, are getting identified in the 40s and the 50s, in their 40s and 50s. 
The other 5% of that group will be children who are struggling so hard in kindergarten, elementary school, and so forth, that they're going to stand out. These are the little kids that went to school planning on being, whose parents thought, they were going to be successful children, no real problems, because they were bright, they were articulate, they thought things through, they made imaginative games up, they did all of the nice little neat kid things that said, this kid's okay. And so it comes as a blow to those parents when the first notes start coming home from the classroom teacher saying, your child writes his letters upside down and backwards. He cannot seem to memorize the sounds of the letters that they make or associate the sounds with the shape of the letter. And mom and dad said, honey, can you do this? Are you trying? And the little kid who's been trying his heart out, he doesn't want to be different than everybody else in kindergarten, says, yeah, mom. And so very, very early, we begin to chip away at self-esteem, at good feelings about ourselves, and we begin to question our own abilities. When that continues throughout the grade school, it's simply exacerbated. It gets worse. Because now, you're supposed to learn how to write cursive. I've got college students who never in their lives will learn cursive. And you're supposed to be able to learn how to spell words. Really, spell, I mean really spell. You're supposed to know what those letters are. My students, I prefer to call creative spellers. Sometimes you can figure out what the word is if it's phonetic, otherwise you haven't a clue. I'll show you some examples of that later on because it's fun. It's fun to, to look and see how far they can go. And maybe you're in a reading group. It's almost certain that you are. And you've got to read out loud. And there's nothing worse than sitting in your second, third, or fourth grade classes and having to read out loud, stumbling over the words. You try to memorize the pages so nobody will know. But sooner or later, they catch you. And then you're the brunt of a lot of jokes. And you feel worse about yourself again. You may be really klutzy on the playground. Not good at sports. You can't catch quite the way a lot of kids can. Most of our kids have that kind of a difficulty in gross motor skills. And so you're the last one picked for the team. You add in all of those things, one on top of another, and you begin to understand why social esteem has become such a critical issue for our kids. And yet, if you look at the research that's been done with people with learning disabilities, forget all of the famous ones. I mean, we, there are plenty of them. You know, Woodrow Wilson finally learned the alphabet when he was nine, he finally learned to read when he was 11. But forget all of those. And take a look at the brains. The research at Beth Israel Hospital, supported in, in part, in major part, by the Orton Dyslexia Society. I know dyslexia is a bad word in Iowa, but forgive me. And you find that of the 13 brains that have already been autopsied between the ages of 15 and 82, you find a phenomenon that you wouldn't find if you autopsied 15 of our brains right here, and that's that they're all alike. Instead of being only 13, 50 cc's per brain, like yours may be or mine may be, their brains are bigger, 1,500 cc's. Instead of having an asymmetrical brain where the right hemisphere is smaller than the left, they're the same size. What we're talking about is not anything that can be caused, called a disability in the sense that there's tissue loss, traumatic brain injury, um, loss of, of mental functioning. It's none of those things. It's a difference in the way the brain is organized. And what that means is, is that many of my LD students have skills you wouldn't be. Artists, 
marvelous architects, draftsmen, carving, sculpture, things I could never do if I lived to be a thousand. Or linguistic abilities, expressing thoughts in such beautiful, wonderful language. One of my students wrote two English papers when he first got on campus. The first was entitled, The Difference Between Dante's Hell and Mine. The second was, The Stench of Inadequacy. I reek of it. What gorgeous vocabulary, but what terrible pain. I simply do not believe that anyone has a right to do that to another human being. He was carefully taught how to feel about himself. And yet here we sit with research that doesn't seem to get very far into the popular press about the, the marvelous gifts that people with learning disabilities display. Some of them are so far out, I can't even imagine them because I, don't, I know that I do not see the way some of my students with learning disabilities see. They see things I cannot see in photography and in art. They hear things I cannot hear. It is not the way I hear. And I tell this story because it so exemplifies what happens with some of, of my students. I have a young man in my program right now whose father is the owner of a major league ball club. He, um, the father came down to bring the, the young man in for testing for my program, and he told me how he had become a multimillionaire before the age of 40. I was interested, since I would very much like to do something like that myself, uh, at some point anyway. But he told me that he was in the stock market, and that when he was on the floor of the stock market, he could hear what was being said in all of the galleries above. And so he always knew what to bid on or sell before anybody else did. Now isn't that the most remarkable, legitimate insider trading trick you ever heard of in your life? He made a fortune because his hearing was so acute. And yet that same acute hearing will drive my students crazy in a lecture class because they are being forced to pay attention to what's happening all around them. Shuffling of feet, moving of papers, sharpening of pencils. Little kids in their classrooms where all of this is going on lose attention and finally quit listening. Then they're called daydreamers, not paying attention, and all the other things. But it's not that. It's just that the brain gets tired of trying to listen that hard. An analogy for you to understand it better would be this. Imagine that you were trying to listen to a very important radio broadcast on your car radio, but all you could get was static and a few words every now and then. We've all experienced that. That's the way they hear all the time. You turn off the car radio when you've heard as much as you can stand. They don't have that option. And so they tell me the things that they do to overcome it. They put their head against the dryer while they're studying. They have the fan or the air conditioner on no matter how cold it is. You know what that is? It's called white noise. You can buy a white noise machine for 50 bucks at Sears. And what it does is to tune out all of the extraneous noise around you so that you can pay attention to what it is you want to listen to. There's also a machine that I use with my students, with especially those in the large lecture class, whereby the professor wears a little battery on his waist, a lavalier mic on his shirt, and there's a, an earphone in my student's ear. There's no wire between them. But the sound goes directly from that teacher's voice, goes directly into that student's ear and allows them to understand what is being say, said in an otherwise I mean, not noisy in the sense of motorcycles and everything, but just people movement in a classroom setting. So these are the things that I want you to understand. Because if you understand that and put that into your vernacular where you can 
anticipate, well, maybe that's why so-and-so functions in this way. Maybe that's what's causing this problem. That you can be more understanding and more helpful to the students around you, to those you teach, and to your own children. Now, most people with, with learning disabilities have a difficulty in some of the social adjustment issues simply because they are wounded so often in public schools. Many of them have difficulty in reading facial expression and body language. If you stop and think about it, most of the things that you learn when you're little are learned visually. Mom didn't usually sit you down and say, sweetheart, this is the way you turn on the faucet. This is the way you open a door. You watch as a baby, as an infant. You watch and you see how they do that and then you go out and try it yourself. And eventually you get it. But if you think about facial expression and body language, those are visual tasks too. Now if I stand up here and I look at you and I say, well that's a pretty dress. My body language, my face, and the tone of my voice are telling you that I really like it. But if I say to you, well, that's a pretty dress, you know darn good and well I don't mean it. Because body language, facial expression, and tone variation of my voice have changed. If you have a learning disability and you don't pick up either on the linguistic changes in voice, pitch, and tone, and many of our people do not, or you are not visually oriented, you have trouble learning how to read, what makes you think you can read facial expression or body language any better than you can a written word? Put those into the framework because learning disabilities is usually thought of as an academic disorder. It's not. That's only one part of it. To ignore the other is to ignore the whole person. Fine motor skills are also usually poorly developed, and so you have papers that are handed in and they're always marked messy. People who write in, in such a way that they, it is difficult for others to read it. If you look at the math papers of our little kids, what they've done is they've got the paper and they've drawn off the sections for each map, for each math problem, so that the teacher will know, oh, hey, teacher, this is one of them, and here's another one down here, and here's another one over here. They know that spatially they haven't got it all lined up in neat little lines and that maybe somebody's going to need a clue to know which problem goes with which answer. As they mature, many seem to retreat into a fantasy world. I never understood this until my students started teaching me and until my LD daughter wrote in her social work master's paper that a fantasy world was a world in which you could be safe. A fantasy world was one in which you didn't have to know how to do algorithms and nobody cared if you could spell physician. And you could be Sir Lancelot the Bold and you could be normal, better than normal. And this is what my students teach. My own son told me when he was in the second grade. Well, actually, he was in the seventh grade when he told me. He had come home winning the science award fair at the high school. And I was in the kitchen, so what else is new? Cooking dinner, and he came in with the prize for the seventh grade science trophy. And I hugged him and I said, wow, honey, things sure have changed, haven't they? And he said, yeah, Mom. When I was in the second grade, I used to pray that God would let me die because there wasn't anything I could do well. Well, I don't know many moms you can say that to without getting a reaction. And I cried. And at that time, when he was in the second grade, the only thing we knew to do for learning disabilities was perceptual motor activities. They marched on balance beams. He took his sister's plastic bracelets and put them on Coke bottles, developed eye-hand coordination. And I said, oh, honey, I'm so sorry that you had to go through that. I was doing everything I knew how to do to help you. And he said, yeah, Mom, I know. The only thing that got me through was you and knowing that I was the best bracelet putter on Coke bottles in the whole second grade. 
and we survived. When he graduated from medical school, I hugged him and said, you did it. You did it. And he said, no, Mom, you did. We did. You're my rock. And if you can be somebody's rock, no matter what level it is that you work at, teach at, or at or yourself, there's nothing more wonderful in the world. Now, nobody plans to give birth to a handicapped child. Nobody would willingly wish that on anybody, unless you really are a masochist. You have to go through the stages of mourning and denial and guilt. I mean, I think there, not a one of us hasn't thought, oh, dear Lord, did I let him roll off the bed? Did I not take him to the doctor fast enough when he had a fever? Didn't I eat the right things? I mean, you know, now you hardly can eat anything that doesn't cause something. So all of that is in your mind. Sylvia Richardson, who is a dear friend of mine, says that in the delivery room, doctors issue two things, your baby and guilt. So moms are born feeling guilty. Then maybe she's right. But we do have the opportunity to decide how we're going to react when we are faced with a disability, either in ourselves or in our children or in our students. Our own personalities will de determine a part of that. How well we react to things. What our sense of humor is. What our support system is around the family. Do you have people you can talk to? Do you have other LD friends that you can share these things with? We have a hilarious time at Achieve, my college program. Because for the first time in their lives, my 150 students are with people who are like them. They are not in a classroom with behavior disorder kids, you know, acting out kids, uh, people with, with uh, really severe disabilities or low IQs. They're in with students who look like them, act like them, go to the same college classes they go to, and then after they become comfortable, it becomes a very humorous kind of thing. They work out things together. When my daughter and one of her friends were filling out the ACT forms for financial aid for school, well, Annie is dyslexic, has terrible trouble reading. Tara can read anything, finally. <laughs> but I had coordination, she's very dysgraphic. She could not fill in those little dots. She would be off on one and then, you know, the whole thing was lost. So I came in one day and here are the two of them sitting on top of the desk. Tara's reading, Annie's filling in the dots. Annie locked her car keys in her car so many times once with the car running, that we went out and we bought her one of those expandable keychains, you know, on the brightly colored neon ones that look like a telephone cord, fastened it to her belt so that she couldn't get out of the car unless she took the keys out too. And these are jokes, you know, these are fun things that you do to put the disability in perspective. We're so hung up on disability that we stop, we don't stop and think about all of the abilities and the way you handle them. The fun part. I've had students say to me, you know, after one of these outrageous things that we've done to somebody, you know, there are days when LD is just plain fun. And that's where it ought to be. That's where it ought to be. We get so down in the mouth about all of these awful things that we're not going to be able to do or our children aren't going to be able to do or our, our students aren't going to be able to do that we, we ignore the wonderful basic humanness of people with learning disabilities and all of the things they are capable of doing. My poor little LD boy called me this week. He just rented a house in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where he's working for a hospital starting in June. It has a dock on a canal and a swimming pool and a jacuzzi. Poor little handicapped kid, I don't know what I'm going to do about him. And I've got these 700 graduates. And they're every place all over the world. And I can guarantee you that they don't feel like poor little handicapped kids anymore either. And that's the beauty of the whole thing. But if you really want your child or your student to develop into all the things that he or she can be, you really have to start early. 
You have to learn how to be enablers, whether you're teachers or parents or friends or LD yourself. By being an enabler, what you are doing is enabling people to compete in a social world because that's the world you have to live in. I mean, in all honesty, how long has it been since anybody asked you your reading level? That's not something we do when we're adults. You pick your friends on who they are, and boy, if we're not going to have an auditory overload on this program, I don't know what. <laughs> Remember that static? But you have to be an enabler in the sense of you don't know how to do something, Think about a new way of trying it. You ha you're having trouble learning something? Find somebody who can teach you another way. Be an enabler, not a disabler. You don't know how to find a, your way around campus? I mean, I have students who literally don't, and this is a big campus too. I mean, how do you find the right classroom in a big building if your numbers get reversed all the time on you? How do you call your tutor? if you keep flipping the numbers every time you want to call. Those kinds of things are the realities in the life of a person with learning disabilities. Those are, I mean, I had one student who went to his tennis class faithfully every day, all semester long. Only problem was it wasn't the right section. So the teacher in whose section he was actually enrolled saw, you know, saw this name on his grade slip, the kid had never shown up, so he flunked him. It took me forever to figure that one out, because in comes my irate student saying, I went to that class every single day, how dare he flunk me? And I was a pretty good kid, I thought maybe he probably did go to class, I mean, he didn't miss all of them, I knew that. Finally, you figure out these little tricks, oh, wrong section, he got a B. <laughs> But those are the realities of, of the kinds of difficulties. When we stop and think that we're just talking about a grade point average, we aren't even touching LD. We aren't even beginning to touch it. So we have to be the enablers to find out ways of teaching those things that our client, student, child, whatever, doesn't know how to do. And to do this, as parents, we have to take charge of our own lives first. That means that we must learn to be fighters when that's not in our nature. That we have to read the federal law when we'd rather be sitting on the couch with a novel. We have to, to do the things that are, are just simply not the way we were brought up to be. Maybe we have to become more fighters. Everybody thinks it's really funny now that I really was a rather quiet child. I'm certainly not a quiet adult, not after all of this. But that's all right, too. I had a choice. I could let my children fail, or I could learn as much as I could and fight for them and for every other person's child as well. You pay a price for some of that. But you can gain an awful lot, too. Now, as parents, you'll find that you will feel things more deeply about this child or these children. The hardest thing to deal with is his suffering. And those of you who are sitting here and have a learning disability yourself, think every now and then about your parents' pain because it certainly was there. They had to learn to try not to hate the children who persecuted you. They had to try to think up all kinds of ways to keep your self-image intact long enough that you could grow up. For parents, these are your goals. You try to find the things that he or she is really good at and make sure that other people know about them. You take his butterfly collection into school and ask the teacher to allow him to show it for science class. You take his plaster cast of animal footprints into school that he made for Boy Scouts. You allow him or her to show in, in ways that are positive what they can do so that they're set apart in positive rather than negative ways. When my children were growing up, they took classes in everything, the YMCA, the Kiwanis Club, the church, 
Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts had to offer. Some of those things didn't last into adulthood. Ballet dancing didn't. My daughter is 5'10", and she has never been light on her feet. But the microscope that we had on the dining room table forever, Lance used to dissect the sharks we used to fall, find on the beach at Cocoa Beach. And in our house, if you cut yourself, you couldn't fix it till you bled on a slide. So all of those things lasted. And he became what he has wanted to be since he was very, very small, a physician. So you find those things that are helpful because everything teaches something. You learn to canoe, you learn to use both sides of your body. You learn to trampoline, that's both sides of your body too. That helps you when you catch a ball and when you learn to skip and when you ride a bike and all of these other things. In other words, they make you a part of the group rather than setting you apart from the group. Tell your children about their learning disability as they, under, as they are capable of understanding it. Just like sex education, you don't tell them everything at once, you tell them as, as they begin to understand. Don't be ashamed of them or of their behavior. Explain that child's needs and what your goals are to the other family members. Grandmas, grandpas, brothers and sisters. I remember my older son coming to me once and saying, Mom, does he do that because he's LD? And I said, yes, he does. And he said, oh. And that didn't mean he stopped trying to kick his brother out of the bunk bed or conning him into taking his turn of the dishes or any of those other things. But it did help him understand it better. And now that particular son works for the Special Olympics, which I think is kind of neat. Now, the earliest one can begin to prepare, the more likely the young person will be to be successful. Parents and teachers must join together to develop adult skills. At home, that means giving the child responsibility. I know it's easier to do it yourself. I got a million stories where it would have been a lot easier to do it myself. But how do they ever learn? Now, parents are afraid to give their klutzy kids a knife to peel potatoes or cut, or cut up a pumpkin. I, I can't tell you the numbers of college kids I have who have never carved a pumpkin. Now, how are they ever going to learn basic skills around an apartment if we never allow them anything because they might hurt themselves? Now, that's too protective. It doesn't do anybody any good. Don't you allow your other children to learn how to make salads, to clean up the bathroom, to sort the silverware, to uh, pick out the toppings on a pizza? How are they ever going to learn to make decisions unless we start them small where it's safe? Sorting the socks, sorting the silverware, getting into seed packets. You know, as, as they mature, you give them more and more maturity level kinds of things to do. We as parents assume that people with learning disabilities know directions, for instance, east, north, west, south, how you go to get from one place to another. I have graduate students in my program with learning disabilities who will tell you that they drove for 11 years on the same stretch to get to the school where they taught and never ever knew where they were were never able to judge how far it was that they still had to go before they got to the school. That same grad student expressed absolute wonder when she was over at my house one night when I got the spaghetti and the spaghetti sauce on the table at the same time. I hadn't known that was hard. So we started talking about it. She was a mother uh, with three little kids and a very nice husband at this point. And she said, you can't believe the trouble I have trying to clean off the table. And I said, Mary Ann, tell me what it is you do. And she said, well, I pick up a cup and I take it to the sink and I wash it. And then I rinse it off and I dry it and I put it away. And then I go and get the saucer and I come back and I wash it. And I go, Can you imagine how long it would take to clean off the table? I said, how do you clean your house? 
She said, well, I go into one room and I find something that's out of place there and I take it to the room where it's supposed to go and then I see something there that's not where it's supposed to be and I take it and I never, ever can get it clean. Don't tell me learning disabilities is a reading problem. We have to also teach people with learning disabilities how to handle success. That may seem strange to you, but if you've spent your life being told that you're unsuccessful, if you've spent your life being told that, well, yes, you managed to do that, but it really wasn't very great, was it? You begin to believe other people. You be begin to believe their perceptions of you, which says, if I can do it, it must be awfully easy. If I can do it, it hasn't got much value, because after all, I can do it. And so we have people who are afraid to risk, simply because there's never been any good stuff that came out of it before. And also, you know, especially when you're a teenager, it's a lot easier not to do work rather than to fail it. Because if you just don't do your social studies assignment, nobody can say you failed. You just didn't do it. And that's a lot easier on the human ego than to try your darndest as you have tried day after day after day and fail. But there are so many things we can teach that we don't understand about. Parents should start off early with little tags, not in the back. LD people cut the little tags out of the back. It's very, they're tactically defensive and it drives them crazy, most of them. But put a little dot someplace so that the child learns that everything with a blue dot goes with everything with a white dot. So they can dress themselves and you don't have to do it. Figure out ways that, that they can learn how to get their own act together in ways like that. Make boxes and put signs on them. All the cars go here. Legos go here. All of those kinds of things. So that you can teach them to organize and how to organize. Teach grooming. I've had young women come up. I told this story a few weeks ago at a conference about a, a young girl that I was working with who just came to me in utter frustration and she said, I have got to do something with my hair. And I said, what's the matter with your hair? And she said, well, I can never get it to look right. You know those curling irons? Well, in the first place you have to look in the mirror so it's backwards. And in the second place, if you get it too close, you burn yourself. And I just don't know what I'm going to do. So I said, could we go to the beauty parlor, please? So we went to the beauty parlor and we got our, both of us got all our hair cut off. Because you could just comb it back and she always looked nice that way. That was one less hassle. And I told this story at a convention. And later on, a mother came up to me and said, you're not going to believe what my daughter just said to me while she was listening to you. She said, Mama, I can go to that college. She understands about the curling iron. Those are the, the best parts. <laughs> conversation. Teach about how conversation goes. I don't know. It seems to me that parents think that children have a, a very significant, interesting form of deafness. In other words, they only hear what you want them to hear you say. So we say things about them as if they weren't there. Talking about their educational plans or how well they did in school or what you're going to do about that teacher. As if the child were not in the same room or the same car. Seems a bit strange. But we do have to use those interactions at the dinner table, hopefully, to encourage good vocabulary and good dis discussion in a place where it's safe to have opinions. Where somebody isn't going to knock you down if they don't agree with you. You, make, you set the rules up and you make them definite. For instance, when we were having the, the, the war in Desert Storm, what should have happened to the, the parents of those little LD kids, what should have happened was that they were going to a map and saying, this is where Kuwait is. This is why it's going to take so long for our troops to get there. Then you start a discussion about, should we even be there? What are the pros? What are the cons? What is your opinion? And then you listen to that opinion as politely 
as you would a stranger's. And you make everybody else in the family listen as politely as you would a stranger's. No big brothers or big sisters allowed to go, <sighs> okay? Because this is the way we learn how to communicate with other people. This is how we test our ideas. This is how we either become afraid to speak out because it's not safe, or we find that tentatively, gently, we learn to accept and to listen to what other people have to say. There are an awful lot of adults who could learn that lesson. Sometimes parents themselves don't understand and cause unnecessary pain. My daughter told a friend the other day something I had never known. And here I go, feeling guilty again. I mean, she's 25 years old. Am I ever going to get over this? Probably not. She's getting a PhD. Is it still going to get better? Not if she keeps telling